Ready. Cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the Southern Arizona C um, CCM virtual chapter meeting. Uh, my name is Cody McGuire. I'm your current president for, for Arizona. All right, well, actually, for Tucson. Um, we have a very interesting presentation today from um, JWL. We have, uh, the, we have, um, uh, yeah, can't speak here. We have a team of group, we have a group of people that uh, did a presentation for them that they're going to do for us. They also did a, recently did this for the CCIM national um, piece right here. So this, which is great to hear their, their take on the market uh, for, especially when it comes to Tucson. Um, so thank you very much. We are going to have a sponsor commercial spotlight for Stuart Title. So thank you very much, Stuart Title, for being a sponsor of our, of, of our chapter. Um, our presentation is going to be from Craig Finfrock, um, Adam Palmer, David Hahn, and um, Timothy Veal, Veeler. Um, all four of them have their CCIM, and they also just all received their JWL as well. There you go. Um, so we are, there's two things. One is our May renewal class has been, unfortunately has been postponed. It has, it, due to other technical difficulties that Patch, it was outside of Patch Sheehan's ability to get it fixed and everything else, um, what happened. So, but he is, um, it has been postponed. It is moved to June. We are not sure exactly on the date yet, but as soon as we do know, we will let everyone else know about virtual class. Um, another piece of very exciting news is that we are going to be having our first in-person luncheon next month on June 8th. Um, chap so we will have that. It will be at the double, the brand new Double Tree downtown at next to TCC. Um, we, for speaker wise, it will be focused more on downtown. I already have Mark Urban has confirmed. Um, he'll be one of our speakers and we are, we're finishing wrapping up the rest of our speakers as well, but please stay tuned for that. But it will be our first one in a live presentation version. I hope I, we look forward to seeing all of you there. I know it's been quite some time since we've seen all our faces and been in person with each other, but um, looking very much forward to getting, you know, back together with everyone and starting back up as, you know, to a somewhat normal stage. Um, we just completed our first ward class uh, on April 30th, and we'll be having two more later this year. We'll, the next one will be on August 13th, and that will be creating reliable valuations. Um, and we also have Jim Bradley from Axie Appraisers will be one of our sponsors as well. And then our November class uh, will be about feasibility analysis for CRE. Um, if, if any of any our members are interested in being a sponsor for that, please reach out to Tiffany or myself, and we'd be happy to help out with that and to get you a part of it. As always, I want to say thank you very much to our gold sponsors and to actually all of our sponsors. We truly appreciate you, um, all your support you have always provided us. Um, so thank you very much. Tile Security Agency, Larson Baker, Realty Executives, National Bank of Arizona, and BVVA Compass. Thank you very much for being a gold sponsor. And then our long list of silver sponsors. Greatly appreciate you guys as well. Beach Fleischman, Chapman Management, Business Development Finance Corporation, Great Western Bank, Cushman Wakefield Picor, Pioneer Title Agency, F Stein Construction, Harsh Investment Properties, Sage Tax Appeals, Stewart Title Trust of Tucson, Alliance Bank, CoStar Group, Managed West Credit Union, Pacific Premier Bank, NAA, NAI Horizon, Red News, Axia Real Estate Appraisers, Midwest Regional Bank, Trend Report, Remax, and Fidelity National Title. If you'd like to be on this great, amazing list of sponsors, please let Tiffany and I know, or any of the anyone else on the CCIM board, be happy to help out and sign you up and be, to be on one of our sponsors. And we truly appreciate you guys. Thank you very much for all your support as usual. So we're going to do a sponsor spotlight. This is one of the benefits you get of being a sponsor. Hi, I'm Michelle Jolly, a commercial escrow officer with Stewart Title and Trust of Tucson. And I love being involved in the changing landscape of our community that commercial real estate affords me. I like to work with Kathy because she's always extremely helpful. Um, whenever I have any questions, um, I always feel very comfortable asking her and she is always very good about pointing out when something might not be right with the paperwork 
and she's just very easy to work with. Hi, this is David Blanchett with NAI Horizon. Just uh, wanted to give you a word about Denise Monahan and the number of different projects that we've worked with over the last 15 years. She's a remarkable escrow officer and I highly recommend her and um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to do some business with uh, Denise in the future. Take care. Thank you very much, Stuart Title. That was a great um, commercial spotlight on, on what you guys do and great seeing other CCIM members and, and um, designees actually put in their time that I'm saying thank you to you guys. Um, we greatly appreciate you being a sponsor for us. So at this time, what I'm gonna let you know, um, we have the Q&A chat here as, you, as usual. Uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button um, instead of the chat version. Um, this way this way we can see the questions and we can get get them, make sure that they get answered for you. Um, another thing to help maximize your screen exposure, there's a way you can move your pictures, you know, people are presenting, you can move them to the side uh, and take them out so you, so you can see a full view of the presentation, which would be a nice thing to do. At this time, I like to go ahead and switch it over to Adam and let him take over the show. So thank you very much for all your support. Hey, Adam, you're on mute. Thanks, Cody. Um, unintended, but I'd like to pay a, a compliment to uh, today's sponsor, Stuart Title. While I do the majority of my business on the other side of the country, I tend to work with that uh, company a lot. Although the guy in the video that was holding up the contract, he looked a little overexcited for a contract, right? Us experienced brokers in the room know that you can't show that level of excitement to get past the closing table, which is at the help of Stuart Title, but uh, thank you again. My name is Adam Palmer. Welcome to the JWL Team 5 presentation on a post-COVID industry. And thank you for inviting us to present to you today. Our topic remains very fluid, uh, but it's intended to include uh, what industry changes. Let's see here. Sorry about that. This uh, screen is not advancing. There we go. So obviously a very fluid topic, um, but our presentation is uh, intended to include what industry changes uh, occurred and what changes are anticipated to remain while also sharing some opinions on uh, what CCI members and CRE professionals in general can do to increase their success in a post pandemic environment. I'd like to note that there is a, a link that will be placed in the chat box and that link will direct you to the full white paper on the subject, which uh, you can print out and bind just as Mr. Finfrock has there. Uh, you know, it was incredibly difficult to try to squeeze all of the effects of COVID into a 20 minute presentation for the Institute. But with that white paper, you'll find a report with much greater granular detail on these topics. Uh, in our report, we will outline the perceived commercial real estate winners and losers of the pandemic, along with other trends that had resulted. But to start, we will discuss those who experienced a positive impact as a result of the pandemic. Now, the pandemic surely reminded all of us just how dependent we are on healthcare, and thus medical office buildings are very well positioned to remain as highly sought after investment opportunities. While practices that were reliant on elective procedures did suffer from lost income early on, that seemed to be a temporary blip in many cases, 
and the increased demand for other specialties balanced occupancy rates near equilibrium across the majority of the country. The demand trends for acute care and wellness facilities accelerated even greater. And as most of this demand focused on locating within the heart of population centers, you can expect to see even more healthcare tenants backfilling retail spaces, or we like to call medtail these days. I think you'll start hearing that term even more moving forward. Another significant change has been the emergence of telehealth, where the usage of same doubled year over year. One can anticipate telehealth influencing some space planning changes too, as practitioners look for increased efficiency to deliver these services. Now, despite the pandemic, medical office rent growth, occupancy and deliveries continue to post strong numbers and further growth can be expected. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Craig Frenfrock to discuss the positive effects that some retailers experienced. Thank you, Adam. The grocery store chain saw significant sales gain as a result of the pandemic lockdown at the expense of full service restaurants. We all have these images of bare shelves and no toilet paper available anywhere. But beyond the initial panic buying, people were relegated to cooking at home. There was an uptick of online grocery sales, which were dominated by brick and mortar chains. Amazon opened the first Whole Foods online fulfillment store, spotlighting their focus to improve their last mile delivery capabilities. They have announced plans to open over a thousand of these smaller last mile neighborhood fulfillment centers around the country. And despite the personal risks of going to the store during the pandemic, shoppers have shown they prefer in-store shopping. In addition to being more internet resistant than their power center and mall counterparts, grocery stores proved to be more COVID resistant too. Now I'm gonna switch gears to uh, restaurants, particular fast food and QSR restaurants. One of the more obvious sectors of commercial real estate to benefit from the pandemic is the drive-through restaurant industry. New operators are getting into the game and old stalwarts have found a new sense of optimism and are re-imaging and re-energizing. Several QSR chains have adopted a new policy that all new locations will have drive-through lanes. And several QSR chains are relocating their existing stores to drive-through locations. Investors and developers are aggressively looking for well-located, tired, or vacant properties to redevelop them as drive-throughs. Strip center owners are looking at every opportunity to convert end caps into drive through end caps. New developments are often designed to have two or three times as many freestanding buildings with drive through lanes on both end caps. The strong triple net investment market is showing no signs of slowing down. This is creating a lot of opportunities for real estate brokers. Now on to retail, in particular, home-related dollar stores and sporting goods retailers. Of the categories that were positively affected by COVID-19, uh, the home improvement business was the number one category with a 22.6% year-over-year sales increase. People found that they had more money to spend and more time on their hands being stuck at home Study at home and work at home has motivated a lot of the improvement projects. The number two category is the dollar stores. The golf business is booming. Dick's Sporting Goods, which owns Golf Galaxy, reported second quarter 2020 revenues for same store sales increased 20.7% from the prior year. And biking has become more popular than ever with bike sales estimated tripling during the pandemic. On to residential development and land, uh, several major demographic shifts are occurring simultaneously that are having a significant impact on the housing market, which was already on fire before COVID-19. 
there has been a surge in existing home sales and housing construction since the spring of last year, making this the strongest housing market since 2006. This has created a backlog that is sure to continue for the foreseeable future. And as the pandemic ends, Americans will continue to buy homes that fit their new lifestyles. Land sales to home builders is an area that CCIMs can capitalize on their market knowledge and expertise. Now I'm gonna turn over the mic to Tim Veeler to talk about COVID-19's effect on the data center sector. Thank you, Craig. Prior to COVID, data centers and industrial were already exploding at a historic rate in our country. And COVID-19 only exploited, expanded, and accelerated that growth and has fueled the already insatiable desire for data to improve business performance, which is driving the growth of the data center industry. Key factors include Internet of Things, IOT. For those of you that aren't aware, the United States is one of the leading markets for industrial IOT-driven technologies. For those of you that are hearing this term for the first time, you need to be aware even your appliances are talking through the internet to, to the metaphorical big brother. They're including artificial intelligence, data and analytics, security and communication, and piping that right directly to the supply chain and all those influencers surrounding that. U.S. data center power market size is estimated to reach revenues of around 10 billion U.S. dollars by 2026. In 2020, the United States market contributed to approximately 47% of the total investment in the global power market, with the southeastern U.S. leading the investments with 36% of the investment. And you'll hear why here shortly. In 2020, over 40 data center investments witnessed across the Western US with total investment of 5.6 billion US dollars. Year over year, significant investments by hyperscale data center operators like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and AWS are gonna to continue to grow. Um, in, as a side note, preparing for the onslaught of what could come with blockchain cryptocurrency. With the sizable contribution from edge data center deployment across the US and electricity pricing varying significantly with the Southeastern United States offering electricity at a lower price of $5.92 per kilowatt hour in the Northeastern US with an average electricity pricing of $10.11 per kilowatt hour, almost double. And now with industrial. The growth of the distribution centers has reached historic levels. Hot topic, and it's just getting hotter and didn't slow down during COVID remarkably. This past year with a scramble from institutional investors and now private individuals who have the capital to compete with the institutions and are creating a significant factor in the marketplace to find remaining sites in key areas along strategic corridors. The trend toward automation of distribution center operations is going to continue to deepen. Further advances will continue to make these technologies more adaptive, productive, and cost-effective back to the AI and the Internet of Things. Artificial intelligence will continue to increase the efficiency of supply chains and industrial real estate at an increasingly rapid pace. And the data collected along the supply chain from operations within these logistics buildings will continue to help the developers make better locational decisions and will improve facility operational performance. Despite increasing automation, industrial properties will continue to employ human workers. Robots, sensor networks, and AI will make the workplace safer, more efficient, and will allow human workers to focus on maximizing effectiveness and efficiency with creative problem solving. New technologies are facilitating the expansion of logistic operations in new spaces and blurring the line now between retail and industrial real estate. And finally, increased throughput from these new technologies can make multi-story warehouses, which are very popular in Europe and a couple of them popping up here in the US. Multi-story warehouses um, and micro distribution centers more cost efficient and continue to be looked at closer as an option to rising demand in the industrial real estate sector. And the relatively compact automated storage and retrieval systems can now allow retail property owners and their tenants to add logistic uses 
to existing buildings. The future looks strong for industrial real estate. Adam. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, the pandemic brought this country's economy to a literal shutdown that none of us ever experienced or were prepared for either. Many sectors and businesses alike were painted into a corner, some with a better chance for escape than others. And when the global shutdown occurred, work from home and Zoom, just like we are today, became household terms. And as employers adapted and employees largely struggled with these changes, analysts had little definitive forecast for the office sector. Dense urban markets where public transportation and small elevators are the norm suffered the greatest and in large part are still suffering. But meanwhile, you know, tertiary markets and suburban single story product experienced their day in the sun too. Now, while the work from home shift appears to be a perpetual one, to what extent remains unknown. Target and Ford have been some recent titans to join others in telling tens of thousands of employees to continue working from home. Yet other forecasts do not seem to be especially bearish. Yeah, as recent as December, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics had listed May 2023 as the predicted target for the full recovery of the United States office using employment. However, as of March, they upgraded that date to January of 2022. So it really highlights what we're talking about, very fluid situation. We can certainly expect the vaccine efficacy to play a large part in determining this sector's near future. I'll now turn it back to Craig to discuss the shortfalls experienced within the entertainment sector. Perhaps the most visible evidence that COVID-19 is the largest disruptor of all times is the devastating impact it has had on the movie theater business. AMC Entertainment, the nation's largest movie theater chain, narrowly escaped bankruptcy. But Cineworld, owner of the Regal chain and the second largest uh, cinema company, was not so lucky. With the lifting of the restrictions rolling out across the US, it is anticipated that in-person movie watching will make a return However, the changes that were occurring with the streaming companies and streaming of movies pre-pandemic now accelerating, it is doubtful that the movie theater industry will return to its pre-COVID condition. Based on changes consumers went through right after the Spanish flu in the early 20th century, all types of physical entertainment became very popular and the period became known as the Roaring Twenties. The similarity between the pandemics extends to the recovery and the term the Roaring Twenties. There is so pen much pent up demand that people wanna get out of their houses and get their lives back to normal. I'm gonna go back to restaurants. Uh, there was a negative impact on restaurants, as you know, specifically the sit down category. The, the pandemic-induced shutdown severely impacted the sit-down restaurant category. There were a lot of heart-wrenching television news stories about operators struggling to keep from going under. PPP kept a lot of these operators alive, but over 100,000 restaurants permanently closed. Over 8 million employees lost their jobs and over 240 billion in revenue was lost as of November. The third party delivery apps such as DoorDash, Grubhub, Postmates, Uber Eats have taken advantage of the pandemic, but they helped save many of these restaurants. Consumers are expected to continue to use these services in the future. The sit down restaurant industry has proven its creativity and resiliency in the past and will survive this pandemic. Now I'm gonna move over to fitness clubs. Fitness clubs and studios went into a complete shutdown. Independent clubs and studios have been hit the hardest, but large chains like Gold's Gym, 24-Hour Fitness, and Town Sports all filed for bankruptcy. 54% of people either froze or canceled their membership, and an estimated 15% of gyms will not reopen. 
But the health concerns brought on by the coronavirus pandemic and the sedentary lifestyle that came with the stay at home orders will motivate people to get back to a healthy lifestyle and health clubs and studios will make a comeback. As far as retail, there's a positive side. The stay at home lockdown exacerbated the problem that the retail real estate uh, industry already had, the internet. This sent many chains over the edge into bankruptcy. There were 29 major chains in bankruptcy as of November 2020. There were 25,000 permanent store closings in 2020. Most were in malls. There were 67 million square feet of negative net absorption of retail space in 2020 and in 24 million square feet additional negative net absorption is slated for this year. Who's gonna fill all of this space? Retail locations will find their best use. Prime locations are still prime locations. New uses will come into existence with change. This is the lesson that retail leasing professionals and owners have learned many times over. The new retail paradigm is showing that cutting edge logistics analytics are demonstrating the need for right sizing. Omnichannel marketing and last mile logistics are helping retailers find their way to profitability. This is leading to a repricing of some retail space as retailers convert some of their store space to fulfillment centers. There are plenty of reasons for optimism, however. There is purchasing power available for most consumers and confidence is building up thanks to the availability of vaccines. Lifestyle centers and open air retail centers are in a position to benefit greatly in the post COVID recovery. This category will fill a need for consumers to get out of the house and enjoy life and social activities again. Landlords are working on creating more open spaces, pocket parks, outdoor living rooms and Instagrammable places. Experiential centers will pave the way for the future of retail centers. Now to the multifamily sector. This sector is either in great or terrible shape, depending on the market and the trade area. The recently passed coronavirus relief bill provides $25 billion in emergency rental relief and an extension of the nationwide eviction moratorium through the end of June. 12.4 million Americans reported they were behind on their rent payments. Multifamily specialists should be aware of where the shifts are occurring Investment demand for multifamily projects is extremely high in these hot markets. Now, David Hun will talk about the effects of COVID-19 on the hospitality and lodging sector. Last year, in the month of March, 2020, uh, we had a nationwide lockdown uh, where everybody was ordered to stay at home. And this had a horrible negative impact on the, lodge, the hospitality lodging industry and basically created economic havoc for the hotel owners. Air travel to Hawaii essentially stopped, uh, creating a huge uh, loss of income for the ho hotels in Hawaii and the islands of Oahu, Big Island, Kauai, and Maui. Uh, but things are now turning around Many hotel owners have been foreclosed upon or purchased at a large discount by developers with plans to actively reposition these projects into low income apartments, as was noted by uh, the Governor Cuomo of New York advocating that many of the empty office buildings and hotels be converted to affordable housing apartments. The Merritt Hotel chain the largest in the world has anticipated a partial recovery in 2021. And we have been able to see that with the, at, with the outcome of the vaccines uh, allowing air travel to resume. And the hotel industry is now beginning to make its comeback 
and will probably fully recover in 2022. Now we're gonna go to the next negative impact area that was uh, hit very hard. Uh, and the positive outcome of that hardship is called in our industry adaptive reuse of a lot of facilities that have large vacancies and are economically obsolete. So a large number of buildings are now being repositioned by the owners and developers that are acquiring those properties for very innovative, active, adaptive reuse to higher and better uses and creating uh, uh, communities with combined retail and uh, uh, apartment uh, usage, mixed uses for a vibrant uh, uh, projects that were community-based. Uh, so large vacant big boxes like Amazon have been acqu have acquired large big box facilities for endpoint distribution centers. They tried vigorously to work with the big box uh, or mall users, but after uh, careful analysis, they found out it's better to uh, flatten flatten the buildings and adaptively reuse the buildings with uh, artificial intelligence and high-speed transportation systems within the building. One of the innovative things that our, our JW Team 5 is recommending is that for all CCIMs to work with their clients and architects, commercial architects, that are willing to meet with you and your clients to uh, brainstorm and actively come up with recommendations for the adaptive reuse of your clients' facilities that need to be repositioned. Now I'm gonna turn it back to Adam. Thank you, David. We wanted to talk about demography and the shift in migration. You know, as millions of Americans were stuck in their homes over the pandemic, many started to reconsider where they wanted to live and where they wanted to work. While attracting new population became a competitive sport for governors from state to state, you know, the fact that the New York Stock Exchange even considers a move to Florida highlights the fact that the COVID migration just may be the most significant perpetual change that affects our business moving forward. I'll turn it back to Craig to go into greater detail. Thank you, Adam. We found out from COVID-19 that there are benefits to companies and workers working from home. Surveys show the majority of people who have the option prefer a hybrid or blended solution. The pandemic has also shown us that there are disadvantages to living and working in dense urban areas. And conversely, there are numerous benefits to living in open and spread out communities which extend beyond the pandemic related issues. As we've talked about throughout the report, there are significant migration shifts that are occurring uh, that COVID has either accelerated or has caused. Some areas around the country are either being hurt by these shifts or benefiting as a result. COVID-19 has accelerated the trend to move to affordable cities, especially in the Sun Belt and mountain states where reopening the economy is fueling their already strong job market. City dwellers are looking to escape multiple issues in search of a less stressed, better way of life. Retirement will accelerate post pandemic. With this and the fact that the work from home trend is expected to continue, people are moving to the desirable areas to live. In dense urban areas such as San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and New York are seeing the greatest exodus. The states of California, Oregon, Washington, and cities that suffered the worst from the pandemic caused shutdowns are also seeing the most out migration. Where are the people going? Simply put, they're moving to where the jobs are being created. Several major companies announced in 2020 that they will move their headquarters from California to Texas and from New York to Florida. In U-Haul's annual report for 2020, 
the states with the most in migration was led by Tennessee, Texas, Florida, Ohio, Arizona, and Colorado. And California ranks last by a wide margin, supplanting Illinois at the bottom of the list. In 2020, the bottom five were Illinois, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Oregon. Adam is going to wrap up for us and talk about how CCIM members and CRE professionals can position themselves for success post-COVID. Thanks, Craig. You know, as we reflect on the past year and look to the future, some of the pillars of CCIM's history remain especially relevant today. It will be as important as ever to make sure you refresh and expand your education. And I know it sounds like a commercial, but it's, it's true. Our clients and customers will be seeking expert advice as they navigate through fortunes or maybe through hardships. If you remember, the broker buzzword early in the pandemic was pivot. We heard it everywhere. And we encourage all members to be prepared to make multiple pivots. You know, volatile markets and consistent threats of disruption will require us to stay on our toes for sustainable success. So in closing, we can relate to this quote from a book called The Future is Faster Than You Think, where we're reminded that the secret to navigating the waters of change is constant and continuous education. And so on behalf of Team 5, we thank you all for joining us today, and we're available for any Q&A that you may have. And remember, you can find the link to our report in the uh, chat queue. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, please, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, the one question I have for you, Craig, is since, especially since you were part of this whole entire panel, but you know Tucson, how do you think Tucson is going to benefit from the information that you you guys were research you guys have done besides the impact we're already seeing from California moving over here and you know buying up a lot of our homes and everything else and um, what other impacts you see from your research well Cody I would say that uh, you hit the nail on the head the the migration shifts that are occurring are especially benefiting Arizona and uh, Tim Veeler's state of Texas and Adam Palmer's state of Florida <laughs> The, the, the three of us uh, have been very fortunate uh, in when we looked at this project and kind of broke it out into the, the winners and the losers. But, you know, we're, we're fortunate here in Southern Arizona. It's just a great place to live and we're right next door to California. But aside from that, you know, our market is especially po poised to benefit uh, from the technology growth and uh, distribution from uh, ports from Mexico. And so I, I think we're in great shape in Southern Arizona. Very good. Um, one of the other questions that I had was regarding the QSRs and everything else, the having additional drive-through lanes. Do you see that for new locations or do you see expanding existing existing where you might have to actually tear down and rebuild? Yeah, a lot of QSR chains are actually relocating to, from uh, units that don't have drive-throughs and notable examples of those are Five Guys and uh, Chipotle is probably the best example I can come up with where all new locations are drive-throughs, but they're also moving existing locations to drive-throughs. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, again, if you have any questions, please use the Q and A button. Um, Adam, for you, since you're in Florida, um, there's we we share a very common thread of having an elderly population that likes to come to Arizona and Florida <laughs> due to our weather. Um, do you see any other migrations coming that way, you know, to those areas besides, you know, that due to our weather, but also other aspects that might that we can, I guess, lean off each other? Yeah, the, the demographics are changing. Um, <clears throat> when northern states were 
um, shuttered to their to their homes in less than ideal climates. You know, a lot of them uh, started migrating south. And you know, when you were looking at you know what kind of people were most likely qualifying for that, they were usually um, on the higher end of a, a wealth demographic than a lot of others, and thus they were in a position to, to make that move. <clears throat> and so largely the people that you've been seeing moving, um, you know, they're people that are kind of changing not only the dem demography in the sense of uh, median age, but also median wealth. Um, in Florida, we've seen wealth management firms uh, triple in size over the past year. Um, you know, preparing for some of the people that have been moving in. Uh, myself, uh, some of the investment inventory that I was listing and selling over the past uh, year, 80 to 90% of the phone calls that I would receive were, were easily, um, you know, people from Boston, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, and the likes. And they were wanting to, to either move their money down um, to Florida or to move themselves and their money down to Florida. And so um, it's, it's really interesting when you kind of, you know, hear the stories of what's happened in areas like Arizona and Florida compared to, to you know, what's still going on in areas like New York and Chicago, um, you know, from one sector to the next, it's just a, a really disparity of stories. Wow. And then which one of you guys was from Texas again? Is that Tim yeah. or David? Tim, yep. so I, I was, we're seeing, you know, Texas has definitely been booming like crazy. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like the the Southern at the bottom where, you know, Arizona and Florida and Texas have been, you know, definitely picking up a lot more. Um, Austin to, is, seems, it's just such a hot market. Um, what else do you see that's going on over there that maybe we can help attribute to and maybe you can capitalize on for our market? So we, we are, I know where to start or where to end. We're setting records in a lot of places, but I'll give you some insight. Some of the local brokers that weren't even aware of a couple of years ago are being forced to be aware of now. Texas, we've always historically overbuilt in the past. That's being constrained right now. We've used up all the major land sites in most of the large urban cities around Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, including. If you want to build a 450,000 square foot building, you need to, um, go out a little bit and so land prices went through the roof overnight you go outside of the major metropolitan areas you're being constrained by utilities and some of these fast growing um little smaller towns which the growth out there is crazy i went and paid a contractor up in up in uh, uh just north of prosper the other day which is about an hour north of where i live and um that little town square it was crazy these prices have doubled in the last two three years home prices, same thing. So all over Texas, it's great. In these smaller towns, you're still seeing a little bit of value. Um, we're noticing some good investment sale values for the people coming to town if they're willing to invest in some of the tertiary markets here. Would you guys see that tertiary markets in general are are being, are really the hot items all over the place or is it not just Right, Craig talked a little bit about the uh, migration folks working from home it's unbelievable the people moving here in, in, in ranches and working remotely. A good friend of mine, ranch broker, he exploded this past year. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, and they're, they're going to some of these smaller towns. It's just simpler, slower, and you can get a lot done. Uh, that Granted, they have, they have good you know, internet. And we talked about the competition of that too, the, the work from home and trying to lure migration to your state. Um, early on, Oklahoma came out. I thought it was impressive that they offered an incentivized program to where they were trying to lure people that would work from home to become Oklahoma residents. And if you remain an Oklahoma resident for 12 months, Oklahoma gave you $10,000. And they started seeing uh, some significant population increase from that. So what did West Virginia do? We'll give you 12. <laughs> and so um, it's kind of an interesting thing, but you know, as it relates to office, I, I know that it's um, you know, a tough thing to put your fingers on that pulse and try to predict where that's gonna end. But I, I wouldn't 
rush to too many conclusions to think that it's going to be um, a, a, a perpetual game changer that's just going to make, you know, office is not dead. Um, you know, I, I represent a, a handful of Fortune 500 clients and I had to get a chuckle when I was showing one of them some space uh, the other day and we were trying to get a handle on whether or not they needed uh, 10 or 15 or 20,000 for this particular requirement. And the manager made the comment, she said, we don't really have a handle on our whole work from work program yet. Work from work, that's, that's the new <laughs> phrase as it relates to uh, Fortune 500 tenants. You know, locally in Florida, when you're hearing people saying that they might go dark on a space or that they're not ready to make a decision, it's not the regionals, it's not the locals, it's that top-down national tenant that still has that woke mentality. They don't really know what to do yet. And uh, I had some conversation with a Goldman Sachs asset manager, which you know those national tenants were the ones that we would bend over backwards for. Those were the ones that we wanted desperately. But throughout the pandemic, guess what? Those are the tenants that have been lining up to kick landlords in the teeth too. So there is some discussion on a high level asset management on whether or not some of these shifts will maybe make us rethink credit. Hmm. That's a very good, wow. Yeah, that is, that is very interesting. That is very interesting. Well, I just want to say thank you very much, Tim, Craig, David, and Adam. You guys did a great presentation. That was a lot of research and a lot of work. And I appreciate you presenting that for us and showing us everything you had to you had on that. Thank you. Pleasure, you guys. You're welcome. And I, I want to make a quick announcement, uh, Cody, if I could. Yes, please. Please uh, keep uh, an eye out for an announcement to come your way from from our chapter on the Casey Conway webinar uh, series CCIM is rolling out across the country this summer. Region two, which is our, uh, Arizona and New Mexico and Nevada and California and Hawaii, will have our Casey Conway webinar on June 23rd at 11 a.m. So you'll receive lots of notices, but I uh, just wanted to bring that to your attention so you can tell all your clients and, uh, you know, people that you do business with, uh, because uh, a lot of people find KC Conway to be a very interesting speaker. He's the chief economist for, for CCIM Institute and a very interesting uh, public speaker. All right. Well, with that. Um, Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Well, good. Um, Tiffany, you want to go ahead and put that up? Someone just mentioned that they do not see the link for the presentation for the material. Um, we will put, we will get that for everyone. But Tiffany, do you mind resharing your screen so we can do, we're bringing back our member to member deals in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, the link is in the uh, chat box. Not not in the Q and A, but it's actually in the chat box. It, yeah, that's right. It's for the white paper. There it is. And it's also on our chapter website, which is where you can find it. All right. So we had several member to member deals, and thank you very much for members for sending this in. Um, and again, and for future, I know we're going to be back in live next month, but if you have some member to member deals, please send it to Tiffany and we'd be happy to put it into a PowerPoint version and have you guys present them more in like the live presentation like we used to do before. But um, since we're kind of in the Zoom world, I thought I'd go ahead and take care of them for them. Uh, the first one is Gary Heinfeld. 
and Lori Schroeder from Tile Security teamed up together. Um, it was Con Continental Ranch 2. Um, it, it was closing with back on March 31st. It was 2,200 square feet. And it was, um, it was a cash transaction for 525,000. This was a retail condo that will, the buyer will use as a dental office. And it was a sale for that one. So thank you, Gary and Lori for working together and getting that deal taken care of. Um, the next one is with Ellen um, Gold, Golden from Goldsmith Real Estate. This is for location on 3940 and 3950 North Campbell Avenue, um, just south of um, River. Um, this, this happened on April 29th. It was 3,100 square feet, uh, sold for 5,000, 5, I mean, 530,000. <laughs> Another cash transaction. And James Bradley from Axia Appraisers handled the appraisal for this one. So thank you very much for the two of you guys teaming up together and sharing this. Um, and the last one here we got um, was from our very own Craig Finfrock and Denise Monahan from Stewart Title, who we also saw in our sponsor spotlight. This is for um, 11101 East Tankaverde Road. It was handled on April 1st. It's 1.66 acres of vacant land. And basically what they're, it's, it was a price for 250,000. Um, they're doing a seller carry back 25% down and five year term. Uh, and basically what it was done is they were buying the land right next door so they could for the barnyard craft house and eatery to basically add more parking. Um, which is always, in my opinion, always a great thing you hear, but especially a restaurant looking to do that right now, especially everything that's been going on. So that's a great expansion. So thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you for our member to member deals. We appreciate you um, reaching out to your other members and working with them. That's always a great uh, um, piece of what I, we have to offer here at CCIM is the, also the networking aspect and, you know, um, the value that we, we get from there. So thank you very much. And please, if you guys have any more member to member deals, um, next time, please send it to Tiffany and I, and we'd be happy to put that up there and also have you present at our in-person meeting. And thank you again. I just want to also say thank you wonderful to our wonderful sponsors, our gold sponsors. Greatly appreciate you. And also to our silver sponsors. Thank you very much for all your support you provide us. Um, we look forward to seeing you um, live again next month. I know we will have a sponsor spotlight that will be done live, not a Zoom version. So it will be very nice. Um, thank you again, Craig, David, Tim, and Adam for your presentation today. We greatly appreciate your support. And thank you. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next month. Look forward to it. It'll be great. Yeah. Bye.